three people and you're going to have four weeks to do something. <laughs> it started out of pure stubbornness, which is great. <laughs> Without necessarily meaning to, I think we found this quite interesting niche. No, we did some stuff and the fact that it's invisible means it works. <laughs> I think art is encoded knowledge and uh, experience. At that time, we were really fascinated by the whole transmedia concept. That was it, not the time-travelling robot idea that we had. Hello and welcome to the Technique Podcast. I am Sam Fry and this is the podcast where we speak to artists about technology. Today's episode is a little bit different. As rather than interview an artist one-to-one, this episode features audio from a number of short talks given by artists at a recent event that I ran with Lumen Art Projects at IBM. The event was themed around the topic of artificial intelligence, and it was a half day of discussion, debate and demos from artists working with AI. These weren't just any artists, they had all had work shortlisted for this year's Lumen Prize for Art and Technology. Aside from one speaker who had actually won the Lumen Prize Gold Award last year in 2018. So today's episode will include a number of artists talking about how they practically work with artificial intelligence. In which case, we cover a range of topics including people's understanding of AI, how to create visual art with artificial intelligence, and the lucky mistakes that you might make along the way. I should say that all the talks were presented with slides, but I think they work well as a purely audio talk as well. I hope you agree too, as I felt they were perfect for this kind of podcast series. Now, let's get into the talks. The first artist is Mario Klingerman, who is a German artist and Google Arts and Culture resident. He is widely considered to be a pioneer in using computer learning in the arts, and he's appeared at places like Ars Electronica Festival, the Museum of Modern Art, New York, and recently at the Barbican as part of their AI More Than Human exhibition. Here he is introducing his work. I'm an artist and, well, I'm (laughs) particularly interested in image making and I'm using technology for that. Increasingly or pretty much exclusively over the past three, four years, I've been using deep neural network techniques to to do that. And I'm not, not even saying that I'm an image maker anymore. I'm more like an image trapper because I go out there and find them. The process of making it, I'm starting to question if if I'm still making them. But yeah, so that's what this talk is about. For those that don't know, neural networks are a set of algorithms that are modeled loosely on replicating how a human brain recognizes patterns. For instance, as people, we might look at a picture of a cat and recognize it as being a cat. However, how would you teach a computer to recognize it in the same way? Well, you could write lots of rules for items to consider when looking at cats. For instance, does it have ears? Does it have a tail? But then you would need to write a lot of rules as it's hard to explain to a computer the difference between a cat and a dog or a mouse or whatever. So the other way is to have an algorithm that allows you to train it through examples, saying this is a picture of a cat. This is not a cat picture. You get it, right? So neural networks are the algorithms that allow you to train it in that way. Sorry if you knew this already, or if you think that was a terrible example. However, many of the talks in this episode are effectively based on that idea, so I thought I'd explain it first. The next thing to learn about are Gantz. So, uh, well, actually, let's let Mario take that one. GANs or Generative Adversarial Neural Networks is kind of what people like me now is kind of love and uh, it's kind of this new magic tool and the story goes like, oh, you throw a few fo- uh, images in a folder, a few thousand, and then the machine just learns to make new, more images like that 
from that look like the training data. And the process behind it is a certain neural network architecture where you pit two neural networks against each other. And one is the generator, one is the discriminator. One tries to make images, the other one tries to catch it making these images and like try to catch the, f the fake ones versus the real ones from the data set. And the ama amazing thing about this is that initially both of them have no idea what an image is or how, like, how to make images uh, or recognize them. And, over time, they both learn from each other and get at the point where not only the discriminator fails to catch the fakes, but we as the human discriminators that look at these images get fooled into taking kind of generated images that we cannot distinguish them from real photography anymore. And of course, this has also like encouraged a lot of people in contemporary art and artists like me to use these techniques because they are really very temptingly intuitive and fun. And so if you follow the press, it, this stuff got a lot of press. You come to believe that kind of the AI art that is made with these things is kind of this low resolution, uh, grotesque kind of stuff. Pretty much we throw folder images in a folder and press a button and we get the art out. And of course, I strongly disagree. And I really not a big fan of some of these examples I show. Because yes, I've been working in this field also for quite a while and I have been trying to escape these kind of cliche looks. But we have reached this point like almost like a hundred years ago when the camera made it into the hands of everybody and you could just go out there, buy a camera and take a few snapshots. So what this poster says is like everybody is a photographer now and now we come to the point where everybody is a neurographer. <laughs> But and neurography is this term I try to kind of establish, which is kind of what I'm doing, is kind of equivalent to photography, where you go out in the world and you take pictures, you frame them. The world is there, but you go there and, and pick the ones. I go into these latent spaces and bring back images from there. So the latent spaces, I come to that point, what that means if you haven't heard of that. But yes, in the end, like buying a camera does not make you a professional photographer or going into an art supply store and buying some paint. There is some more to the process. So I've been exploring this for quite a while, trying to like, 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 see, where can I take this space? What can I do with it? What kind of interesting new artifacts will I get? And what these images that I show you have all in common is that none of them I touched a single pixel. So it's not like I kind of went into Photoshop and manipulated parts of it. In the end, I'm building systems that produce these, and not only this. This is then an example of a choice of 10, 20, 50,000 of images that the machine gives me after I've, give, I've built a system, which then all are somehow in that style, in that aesthetic, but it's still up to me to pick the ones that I find most compelling or speak to me. What also makes working with this neural network so, so nice that it allows you to balance between control and opening up this space that is unknown. Because what I call accident may give you some mark that seems to be more real, truer to the image than another one, but it's only your critical sense that can select it. In Mario's talk, he explains that he gets a lot of traction on social media, some of it positive and then some of it less so. But often he finds a trend that people seem to compare his work to that of Francis Bacon, which he talks about a little bit further. But for me, it was quite interesting because uh, I'm self-taught. I didn't go to art school, so I'm a bit behind in reading my art history things. So I always then pick up something. I read up something later. Say, so at some point, I actually got me this book with uh, interviews uh, by Francis Bacon, which is a book I can highly recommend, which talks about like where he talks about his way of creating art and I found some fantastic quotes which totally spoke to me because uh, it feels like the way he feels about art making is how I feel about working with neural networks so it starts by I really don't know how these particular forms come about I look at them probably from an aesthetic point of view I know what I want to do, but I don't know how to do it. So there's this point that they also, if you are working with analog tools, it's kind of like working with that tool. It's not a direct process that you have that picture in your mind and you put it on the canvas. It's in that interaction with, with the material that 
it develops in front of your eyes. And this one is even better. With oil paint being so fluid, the image is changing all the time while you're working. One thing either builds on another or destroys the other. It's really a continuous fight between accident and criticism. And yes, and that's kind of also my core belief that some external influence, an accident, something that happens that you are not expecting is very important to, to make creative progress because our imagination is pretty much limited by what we know, so we can always just interpolate. And having something like throwing oil paint on a canvas or having randomness in a computer program or errors happening in that process, that is what show, gives you suddenly something, puts a new image or something in front of your face where you then start recognizing, oh yes, this is actually w where I want to go. And then you can explore further maybe what caused that, can I get more of this? And this is how I work with my models. When talking about his creative process of working with artificial intelligence, Mario talks about two things regularly. One is how he embraces the kind of happy accidents and two, that they represent a different kind of artistic artifact. What I also could see there, that there are some new types of artifacts, visual artifacts developing, which are very unique to working with these models. And initially I tried to get rid of them and find ways that it doesn't do that, but eventually I realized, oh, that's actually what makes this aesthetic interesting, because yeah, these are not from neither brush nor JPEG artifact, they are new. Back to Francis Bacon, my ideal would really be just to pick up a handful of paint and throw it at the canvas and hope that the portrait was there. And that is, of course, nice because now, well, we can do that. We have reached a point where we can make portraits using these techniques. I started by using biometric face markers, which is used another neural network, which where you give it a photo and then it extracts certain facial markers, uh, features like where the nose is, the, the mouse and everything. And then you can train a model where you try to train it that it transforms the sketch of a face back into something that looks like the data, the training data. So the technique is called picks to picks. So you feed in an image which is actually the sketch, and you get out another image. In this case, that was an early example. I trained it on uh, engravings from the British Library collection because there were 10,000s of them, and that always looks similar to the distribution of the training data. I made some progress over time to, to get it a little bit better, and I dare to do a little demo because what you can also do is instead of creating that sketch manually, you can use a camera image, for example, that first uses a neural network to extract a sketch like that from the camera image and then feeds that back to another model which re reverts the process. So in this case, there's an example of I trained a model on a, on a silent movie star, but I can switch the model and in this case then use paint like paintings. Uh, the interesting part is actually not to create paintings, but to see when it breaks off. Because the model can't help. It only knows how to create faces. So it, whatever information you feed in, it will transform, try to transform into this face space somehow. And that's where, the, for me, the interestingness starts. One of the tasks I was always trying to do was to get kind of the detail better and better resolution. So I spent like, two years on that, and then NVIDIA comes and, and say, oh, no. So in the end, I realized also I'm not too, I mean, actually, I wanted to be able to create kind of highly realistic faces, but in the end, I wanted just so I know how it works. But in the end, you can use a camera to, to make more people faces. So I actually want them to stay, go a step back and see what can I do that, that I can't do with other tools. As you can hear, Mario sees artificial intelligence as an opportunity to create completely new types of artworks. At this point, I'd like to introduce another artist, Dr. Dave Murray Rust. Dave is a lecturer in design informatics at the University of Edinburgh. His research there focuses on the interesting messy bits between people and computational systems from large-scale social machines through the Internet of Things to personal data and privacy. 
His talk is about working with technology and the role of an artist. So I've called this talk Things That Push Back. I hope you won't be too disappointed that it's not all about AI and it's not all about art, but it has lots of things that is relevant to the practice of both of those. So a little bit about me. I work in a research group called Design Informatics. We're wonderfully interdisciplinary and we look at all the places where flows of data sustain human values. So we look at data as a medium for design and we look at how we can use that to imagine possible futures and have a bit of a sense of which ones we might like to live in. I'm also part of a group called Experiential AI, and our mission is to use creative practice to understand and articulate the possibilities of AI, both for publics, but also for the people that are doing it. So how do we use creative practice to help people within a domain think about what they're doing in different ways? I talk about things that push back. I'm interested in seeing all the stuff around us, whether it's algorithms or clumps of matter or uh, clothes or computers or anything, as things that are somehow animate. And that means that they can push back and they shape us as we shape them. Some of this I do through design. This was a kind of speculative design piece that says we're very used to all of our data being harvested and used by algorithms by lots of people we don't know about. Our Facebook posts get used by advertisers to sell us stuff, or by landlords to see if we're good tenants, or by insurance companies to see if we're a risk. So supposing I could enlist my phone to be on my side rather than on Google's side and get it to lie for me. So using deception to create space for me to be human. So supposing instead of saying that I'm in the pub, it says I'm in the vegan cafe next door. I still get all of the benefits of the location-based services, but I'm allowed to construct a bit of a space to live the way I would like to inside this. Or the one on the right is a calendar plugin that will automatically generate lots of non-existent appointments for you. So it'll completely fill up your calendar. Your boss can't book you. And it really looks at deception by default. So if you actually want to meet with someone, you have to say, oh, I'm sorry, my calendar is trying to be too clever. It's got it wrong. I do have space then. Let's meet up and have a coffee. So to me, a lot of uh, where art and AI come together is looking at the configurations between people and the algorithms. This is a piece of one of my students, Mark Williams. He's got a chair with a smart fabric cushion on it. And it's great fun because you sit people down on the chair and they see the white dots moving next to them. And then you explain to them that actually this funny pattern of dots is their bum print. And that's nice and tweaky. It makes people feel a little bit uncomfortable. But then you start to explain that from your bum print, you can understand your posture. And from your posture, you can start to get a sense of your emotional state. And so if you ask someone a slightly tricky question and you see them clench up, then you learn stuff about them. And that leads very quickly into going, well, who put this chair there? Who owns the data? Who gets to see it? Who's creating the algorithms that make sense of it? So by doing these provocative design things, we can start to ask tricky questions. As you can tell, Dave is a really engaging speaker, and it's not surprising that he's trying to help people make sense of how technology is being used in their day-to-day -day lives. He then goes on to talk a little bit about some of the exhibitions that he and others are running, which include a bit of work that's quite similar to that of Mario's from before. We've just had our first exhibition. We had a curated show of some works by Jake Elworth, who is a previous Lumen Prize winner. And I just want to show a couple of those here. This one wasn't in the exhibition. It's one of his earlier works. It's called Machine Learning Porn. And I love this piece because what he's done is taken the YouTube copyright filter and turned it inside out and got it to continually generate images that it thinks might be pornographic. Um, I've not put the video on here, but I thoroughly recommend going to his website. It's up there. You can see it. And as well as being wonderfully unsettling, it also really drives home the point that when you train a filter, you're actually filling it full of all the images that you're looking for. So you can't do that without actually encoding the bad stuff if you feel that this kind of pornography is bad. So to me, that's a really nice example of how creative practice can help make tangible and vivid and uh, visible what's going on within AI systems. The work of his that we did show, we had a new commission of a piece called ZZ, which is one of these neural network pieces that generates an endless cascade of imaginary faces. Strong relation to Mario's work. And I hope Mario is smiling and not feeling upset about this. But what, 
What Jake has done is train this on a collection of faces of London drag performers. Get this cascade of images that are somewhere in between. They're in between faces. The gender is quite mixed up and fluid, and it gives us a sense of how machines can start to see us somewhat differently. We showed another of Jake's pieces. This is our space up in Edinburgh where we try and get this stuff out into the world. This is called Closed Loop. It's a dialogue between two AI systems. One of them takes some words and tries to generate an image from those words. The other one takes an image and tries to caption that image. And so they have a continually unfolding discussion of mistranslations, really. One of them will say an image of a cat, and then the other algorithm will try and draw a cat. Um, and because they're both a little bit terrible at what they do, you have this wonderful uh, continuation. If they were perfect, there'd be no creative space. They would just say, here's a thing, and the other one would say, yes, that's that thing. But by finding the glitches and the seams and the wonkiness in the algorithms, you get a very, very interesting discourse going on. So that wonkiness is quite similar to those happy accidents from before. In which case, I'd like to go back to Mario, who is talking here about latent spaces. I talked about, I mentioned latent spaces before, and that is pretty much the most interesting part about working with neural networks. So what is a latent space? So when you train a model to recognize something, like distinguish a dog from a cat and a tree, what happens is you take a pixel image, which is millions of uh, data points, like every pixel is an RGB, and you have a few hundred, like, several millions of them, and the model, the neural network architecture, condenses that, that in number information down to just a few numbers. So let's say 128. So you, it's really like letting out all the air, and what you get is a vector. Imagine you have a three-dimensional vector, like x, y, z, and you just add a few more dimensions. But in the end, you take this huge amount of information and project it into a space. So every dog that you fill in in the top ends up in that space at a certain <coughs> position. And initially, when the model knows nothing, that position is totally random. But then when you give the model thousands, ten thousands of examples, what it tries to do is to shape that space almost like rubber and transform it in a way that, in the end, all the images that you tell it are dogs land up in a certain area here, and the cats try to, it tries to squeeze that space so the cats land somewhere else. So the next time you send in an unknown image, which might show a dog, it will land up in that dog area. So all it has to say, like, OK, yes, this image ended here, so I'm pretty sure it must be a dog. The fascinating thing is, whilst it's learning that, it doesn't just learn superficial features. It learns that cats and dogs have something in common, that they all have kind of eyes and faces and fur, whereas trees have not. So it learns a semantic representation of that data. And we cannot really understand these spaces logically, but we can see them, and, that, and we can then project back out of these spaces. So we can move in there and try to get a glimpse how the machine sees the world and how it relates to how we see the world. And that exploration is highly fascinating. So up to now, we've really talked about the artist training an AI. But here, Mario starts to talk more about that relationship as a collaboration. And sometimes it's the AI that is really deciding which direction this art might go in. What I showed you so far was models that I trained on data that I selected myself. So I had some kind of control what went in there. But now what we're getting is so I call them public latent spaces. There are some models out there. Well, actually, there's one model out there right now, but there will be more. And this is called, for example, Big GAN by Google. And this model is so big or so complex to train that only a company like Google can do it because it costs, I don't know, $60,000 to do that. So nobody with a computer like me could train that model itself. The fascinating thing is, so this model knows a thousand different categories. It's, it's these typical categories that are used to recognize things in images. So it kind of knows the world. And it particularly knows a uh, hundred different dog breeds, but also professions and landscapes and mobile phones. So really, like it tries, like this model is pretty generic in its categories. Some are totally useless. I don't know who selects these categories. I, I would always think that somebody should vote about what categories should go into these models, who needs 100 different dog breeds. But the fascinating thing is, so you have now a model that is publicly available, which becomes almost like a universe in itself. And everybody can go in there. 
And this model works really in a way that you pick a coordinate or you pick that feature vector, which in this case is 128 dimensional. And wherever you go, you find an image. That space is so big that the probability that two people who pick, like, go there will find the same image is, is pretty much impossible. So it, it's really like almost like the world outside there where everybody can go with a camera and, and find something interesting. And so I'm playing now with this idea, like, can I find, what can I find in this particular space? And I mentioned before this, these latent spaces. And for me, the, the most interesting part about working with neural networks is this hyperdimensionality. The idea that you have these spaces where pretty much everything is connected, actually. So there are no hard borders. So you can freely move. And the, the model itself or the space has no real sense for categories. Categories is what we make. We put labels on things and say, oh, this looks like a dog. This looks like a cat. But for the model, it's all a continuous space. And so I'm looking for ways of interestingly traversing this space now. Because also the idea that, yes, I could go on and press the space bar and pick single images out of there. But somehow having the ability to produce an infinite amount of them, the single image might even lose its, its value. So for me, it's more now about the journey through these spaces. So that notion of collaboration with the artificial intelligence is becoming a bigger topic in the world of AI art. Another big topic which is prevalent for any art form is what the role of the artist should be, especially when it comes down to politics and expression. We return now back to Dave Murray Rust, who gives some examples of art related to data privacy. This was a piece by another artist, Pip Thornton. She projected the whole of 1984 word by word over the course of the Edinburgh Festival, which is a fun thing to do in and of itself. But underneath all of the words was their value on Google AdWords if you'd put that out there and ask people to click on it. So this looks at kind of the capitalist aspects of linguistics. You see how uh, large-scale AI algorithms are warping our sense of worth and meaning as it attaches to the words that we use every day. You find some very strange things. Frown was very expensive. Um, and you start thinking, why is that? And it's because beauty product manufacturers want to use it to sell people beauty products, so it's extremely valuable. So you get a very strange sense of where value comes from in words. Another kind of interaction between people and algorithms, this is a laptop trio that I play in with Jules Rawlinson and Owen Green. And we connect our laptops together, we send all of our sounds around in a triangle, and everyone is continually resampling and reprocessing each other. And it, it's a great kind of swamp of noise and mess. There's a couple of places where algorithms come into this. One is Owen's written a score, where there's an algorithm that sits in the middle, and it looks at how much noise we're making and how hard we're physically working to make that noise. And if you're making a lot of noise without doing much, which is a thing that happens in electronic music, it'll cut you off. And it'll cut you off violently and brutally. But of course, as musicians, that can be an interesting thing to work with. So we'll start playing the algorithm. So by putting even quite a simple bit of listening in the middle, we can get an algorithm to reconfigure the way that we're improvising as people. When you see people playing laptops on stage, you have no idea what they're doing. And the number of audiences that come back and say, oh, that was great, but I don't know who was doing what. And for them, that spoils their enjoyment of the piece. So Jules has been using some machine listening work to try and make sense of what's going on. Uh, we're all coming out in a different color with spectrums and an analysis of what we're doing individually. So that as you watch, you can go, oh, there's that pulsing yellow bit. That's Dave doing something. Oh, the purple squiggles. I can see that Owen is making that noise. So it's a way to use a bit of AI to help people understand what's happening right in the middle of the moment of creative practice. And some of this is underpinned by Owen's work on the Flucoma project, uh, which is trying to bring machine listening and machine learning algorithms into the hands of musicians as things that they can play with and use creatively. And they're very interested in how you can take these algorithms and rather than trying to get them to do things perfectly, get them to do things wrong in musically interesting ways. Because then you get something creative you can respond to. And they're spending a lot of time not just packaging them up and putting them out in the world, but working with composers, musicians, other kinds of artists to say what actually makes this stuff work for you. Theoretically, what makes this work for me is 
a few different things. One is a sense that mess is really useful. The world is messy. The world is complex. Trying to simplify it in computer systems is a difficult challenge, and it often means that you miss out on the interesting textures. I like the sense of things, objects in the world that work with us and that shape our behaviors in different ways that have their own lives. So going back to Lichtzuchende, which is the reason that Rothio and I are here, it's a society of robot sunflowers. They talk to each other by sending beams of light between themselves. They have a sense of internal states. They can be sleepy, they can be tracking things, they can find a sense of joy in connection. And it means that when we send people in there with torches, they can interact with these robots in a way that they are not used to interacting with anything before. And they can start to uncover the ways that they communicate and respond. But talking of mess, it started on a very messy desk with glue and toothpicks and a little bit of strip board, two servo motors and Arduino for light sensors, really just playing around. But suddenly, by putting a very simple algorithm that just moves towards the brightest light into a physical form, it starts reading as nervous, as excited, as curious. Um, and even though I know that it's just very simple code, I can't help have a bit of an emotional response to it. So then it starts driving the way that I'm thinking about this kind of practice. So it develops a little bit of agency in the world. It's affected the way that I'm thinking about things. And once you have some things that have agency, if you have sev several of them together, you can look at the interagencies between them. So when we had three of these emerging creatures together, we found that they do these funny dances when they get close. I know that this is uh, just a digital algorithm overshooting. And they're like this, so they try and move together, so they go like that, and they go like that. It's just like any time you walk down a corridor, someone's coming towards you on the same side of the corridor, and you walk right, and you walk left. But of course, it, it then reads as kind of a territorial display, don't come too close to me. So looking at the interactions between all of the things in the system becomes very interesting. We spent a long time with this piece saying that we weren't in there as designers with a grand vision. We were in there trying to help these things become what they wanted to be. And at some point, we had to actually deal with the fact that that's rubbish because we're in there trying to create artistic practice. But there's a balance in there. Sometimes we look at the things we've made and we get them to tell us what to do next. Sometimes we're telling them what to do next. So we have this sense of entanglement. We're codependent on each other. As creators, we're dependent on the things we make, but they're entirely dependent on us to get from place to place. So we shape each other. Dave spoke about his project Lixsekunda just there. Lixsekunda, if that isn't a mouthful, is an interactive installation of robotic creatures that appear to communicate with light. He actually collaborated with someone else on that project, Rothio von Jungenfeld, and she spoke at the event too. Here she is. We'll try to explain some of the kind of maybe more research-oriented questions we've been working on for the last few years in relation to Lichtsuchende. I'm a Spanish-German artist and researcher, and I've been based in the UK for over a decade now. Used to be in Edinburgh, now I'm in the southeast, much sunnier and warm. And I work at the University of Kent School of Engineering and Digital Arts. Rothfio's talk is much more about how they tested people's interactions with their artificial intelligent installation and to see what the public's perception of AI is. One of the things that we realise is that wherever we put them out and we present them, the interactions and the actions and the gestures that people perform, the things that they do are very different and they surprise us. This little girl, she's just kind of taking their torch and going and teasing the flowers. And I'll play it again because it's really cute. And she's teasing the flowers and then the, the adult comes and wants to take the, the torch away or like hold the hand and make her do the gestures that they think are needed. But she's not having it. She's like, no, I'm doing my own thing. And this is fun. This is how I want to interact with them. And then we've seen a lot of people, if if they take the time, so she was very eager to just tease them all. Well, other kids in this case, I've chosen two examples of kids because they're very illuminating, because they're free from all the social constraints and they don't touch, don't do this thing in an art context. And they just, in this case, this, person, this, this, this child decided to sit down and really explore and take the time to find out how this thing works and spend a lot of time just 
shining the light and trying to figure out what it is this creature is, is doing and needing to do. This particular child decided to kneel down, sit down, and come really close to, to this one creature. So it's more like a one-to-one -one rather than me and you. Rothio and Dave were keen to understand how the public were engaging with their installations and had seen people interact with it in a few different places. However, it was always difficult to get real data on how different people interacted. So they decided to set up an experiment which was controlled and allowed them to really test how different people perceived their work. They started by asking their subjects some questions. Tell us, what do you think a robot is? And they would come up with things like this, like it's a machine, it's a mechanical, no, it's a mechanical thing. It's something that is technical, it can help and assist people. And it's like an extra hand, something that helps you with the task. Repetition was also part of these kind of doing tasks or it enhances your, your actions, so something that extends your capabilities. Something that is artificial, definitely not or, non-organic, that it's either a structure or a creature. So the, 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 this creature thing came out of some of the participants that we interviewed and tested. And it has a, a sense of awareness of, of the world around it. And we asked them, okay, one word to describe our little creatures. What are the Lichtsuchende for you? If you had only one word, they would, say, they would say that they were fun and they seemed content. They were cute lights, a bit like kids, happy to do their own thing. Plant-like, it was like a field. Creaturely, so the notion of creature was coming out of participants, not just us. Ephemeral, something that seems, you know, has a life, so it will eventually fade. And also some people felt alienated. And as something that was a revelation, something really unexpected. Someone said, it's, it's like being in a nursery, as you, where you, you know, the kids are perfectly happy and they can just have fun with each other. And if you come in with sweets, then they will kind of look at you. But if there are no sweets, then they'll carry on playing their own thing. So a bit like us, or like people going into the space with a torch. A great analogy, I'm sure you'll agree. And now for a final thought from Dave Murray Rust on why artists should be working with artificial intelligence. So as a final thing to finish with, why on earth do artists want to get entangled in all of this uh, funny technological process that can be quite hard work, it can be quite bruising, it can pull you into areas you don't expect. But still, my favourite take on this goes back to Georgia Bourne and Barry, uh, their logics of interdisciplinarity. Why do we do interdisciplinary practice? And one of them is accountability. When you bring art and science together, the artistic practice can help science to make itself accountable to society by making clear what is going on, by illuminating it. There's also places where you're, you work at the intersection of domains and they feed off each other um, and both of them benefit from that encounter. So creative practice can actually stimulate uh, development in machine learning. But the one that I think is most interesting is where creative practice shifts the values and representations of knowledge. So when we can use artistic practice to help people who are doing machine learning, who are doing AI, to rethink actually what it is that they're doing and come up with new ideas about how that works. That's it for today's episode. Thank you very much to Mario Klingerman, Dave Murray Rust, and Rothio von Jungenfeld for featuring in this episode. They gave a really useful insight into what it's like to be an artist working with new artificial intelligence practices today. Thank you also to the Lumen Art Projects team that ran the talk itself and brought the artists to my attention. They do some great work and are becoming a really strong place to learn about what's happening in digital art today. I hope you enjoyed listening to the episode. It was a little different to include snippets of people's presentations. Please let me know what you thought as I'd quite like to do one more of these featuring the other artist from the event, Maya Petrick, who spoke about her views on art as experience and how artificial intelligence is enhancing that. 
that's all the time we have for this episode we will be back again next month with another interview so if you do like this content please take a moment to subscribe and ideally give us a rating until next month take very good care of yourself goodbye